Episode 253, Fruit. This is the Change Underground for the 19th of April 2021. I'm your host, John Moore. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. Last week I looked at specialising in herbs. This week the focus is fruit. There is much to recommend this approach to food production in the backyard and on a small holding. I divide fruit into three areas. Tree fruits, bush fruits and ground covers. Let's start with the ground covers. Frigeria and Anasia, or as we're more commonly known, strawberries, are the obvious choice. Because you can grow them for a few years, they fit nicely into, say, an eight-bed rotation within the veggies, and it would go something like this. Bed one, sweet corn. Bed two, tomatoes. Bed three, beans. Bed four, potatoes. Bed five, curcubits. Bed six, strawberries that are one-year-old. Bed seven, two-year-old strawberries. And bed eight, three-year-old strawberry plants. Then move each bed forward each summer, replacing the three-year-old strawberries with sweet corn and the curcubits with strawberries in their first year, and move everything else up one bed, obviously. You would probably need to buy these in as new strawberries because they are susceptible to viral infections. But if you found you didn't have any viral effects, you could take runners from the first year's plants, pot them up and use them in the new bed once the curcubits were out. In theory, with good soil health and choosing older varieties of strawberries, the viral thing really shouldn't be an issue. Maybe starting from seed using heirloom heritage varieties would be a good workaround. I'd go for the older varieties as they hadn't had the inverted commas market pressures to produce large, brightly coloured, tasteless fruit that transports well. Strawberries have been subject to this effect as much as tomatoes and it's very disappointing. I know the ones we grow here at home have got much more flavour than the ones we've had to buy in town. As an alternative, there's a species, Frangia vesca, also known as alpine strawberries. <coughs> now these are related to your standard strawberries, but they have much smaller fruits with a huge flavour punch, and they do not transport well at all. They're available in white and red, and they are on my to-plant list they have to be started from seed unfortunately so that's going to take a bit of fiddling over winter a more traditional set of fruits would be from the curcubit family itself so rock melons watermelons uh, sweet squash and pumpkins would all be alternatives in the ground covering area now when it comes to bush types which are also basically perennials these types of fruit open to a much larger range of choices uh, blueberries, raspberries, brambles, joster berries, tassy berries, currants, gooseberries, I could go on. Now these are biennials, the raspberries and brambles, or perennials, the rest of them. And even the biennials have perennial root systems so that they can all form a backbone structure to a garden. Each bush needs more space than, say, a strawberry plant, but the productivity per unit area is about the same or higher. Now, why would we choose to go down this path? Well, harvest times, and this will vary, as will the actual bushes, brambles you can grow where you are, will also vary, but the harvest times could be set up to match holidays or children's school holidays, so that plenty of labour is around when you need it. Otherwise, after planting, it's just the pruning and the feeding. Harvest really is the big time for these fruits. Now, if you've picked older varieties for flavour purposes, the berries will need to be frozen or preserved in some way. Of course, large amounts can be consumed fresh, and I am guilty of this when it comes to the raspberries in particular. But this uneven workflow could be just the ticket with your lifestyle. In a larger backyard or allotment situation, it might be a, little, a great little money earner, especially with a value add. So rather than just fresh raspberries, you could make and sell raspberry jam, raspberry coolie, raspberry cordials, wine, and even dried raspberries. And with most of the fruits mentioned above, all of these could be an option. In fact, while the time, with the time management involved, fruit patches could be spread out across a suburb or neighbourhood, using other people's land where you pay for that privilege in fresh or preserved fruit treats. 
Now this type of fruit, bush size, is not a particularly popular niche. Either it's produced across vast acreages under polytunnels here in Tassie, or it's just a bush or two in people's backyards. I would think eBay at least would be a good place to test selling some of the preserved fruit options. Wine might not be legal, except for personal consumption, but the other options would be perfectly fine. Uh, tree fruits. This is where your options both open wide and come crashing against space limits. I remember a few years back, uh, well, ten years as it turns out, we had an ancient pear tree with thorns growing all over it and lumpy, bumpy fruits that were very weird looking, that were the best tasting pears I've ever eaten. I never did track down the variety, but I did discover that there are over 30,000 named varieties of pear in the world. Now, this tree was 20 metres or 60 foot tall, gnarled and twisted and at least 110 years old, and it would not be a variety for the backyard or a pot on a balcony. However, grafted onto rooting stock and espaliate along a fence line or garage wall, it might, make the cho might be the choice to make. The spines probably ruled it out with small children around and whatnot, but the point is there are so many choices, one would fit well. I certainly wouldn't be sticking to pears either. Depending on your location, other palm fruits like apples, quinces and locusts would be good. Stone fruits are an option as are citrus. Even almonds and hazelnuts could be worked into the garden plan. The reason for bush fruits, the reasons for using bush fruits are not dissimilar. <clears throat> the reasons for using bush fruits are not dissimilar to why you'd favour tree fruits. With a few trees and a longish fence line, you could space out the harvest for a more gradual approach across the harvest time. From early varieties all the way through to the late ones, your choices would determine how busy you'd be and for how long. The same preserving ideas would apply to these fruits as well as the others, and for the same reasons. Now we fed our excess fallen fruit to our yos before mating, to have them on a rising plane of nutrition leading into mating. This meant far more twins, which seemed a good swap for some spoiled fruit. Uh, we don't have any sheep anymore, so we just feed them now to the pigs and the chooks and still have plenty of a plenty for eating fresh, preserving and baking. So much like the herbs last week, I'm not suggesting you can't mix fruit in with other foods. Indeed, a mix of vegetable herbs and fruits is what I grow here. The point of the last two episodes is to show that with little specialisation, you could be growing more of your own food than you realised, especially if you don't have the time for gardening all year, what with work and other commitments. There is much to be said for the perennials in the system. They tend to be more stable over time, they solidify the soil structures around them, providing anchor points for mycorrhizal structures, and they capture carbon for the long term. I'd love to see more fruit trees as part of municipal plantings, but I can see the fruit industry whinging about unsprayed crops and disease harbouring clusters of fruit trees. We can but see the vision and work towards it, I guess. Okay, so that's basically it for the fruit. And a quick reminder that the Change Underground is supporting the Babugo Conservation Trust in Uganda through a 10% surcharge, well, surcharge, no, 10 of all uh, course sales and the Buy Me A Coffee link at worldorganicnews.com will be going off to the Babugo Conservation Trust and their uh, sustainable farming program. Now, if you have any thoughts, questions or suggestions, I open a new Facebook group that I've called imaginatively the Change Underground Podcast Group. Uh, you can search on Facebook or there's a link in the show notes and in the transcripts over at worldorganicnews.com slash episode underscore 253. And a big hello and welcome to Pat and Amy in the group. Remember, fruit growing is a great way to decarbonise the air and recarbonise the soil. Thank you all for listening, and I'll be back next week.